Okay, so I just did this problem, and so I'm going to start off the beginning uh, fairly fast. Uh, if you want to see my previous solution, that's fine, but here's the situation. There's a ball on a curved ramp, and it rolls down the ramp, and then shoots off the ramp and onto the floor. In my previous solution, I assume the ball actually just slides down the ramp and doesn't roll. But now I want to take into account the fact that the ball is rolling. And so that's just going to change this initial part. So it's going to roll down the ramp and it's going to have some velocity V1 and then it'll be a normal projectile motion just like before. But it will be also spinning, but spinning in the air right here won't really change its motion. Okay, so let's start again with the work energy principle just like before. And I say work equals the change in energy and my system is the ball plus the earth. And that does not include, I guess, plus the track. Should I include the track? I think technically I have to include the track. Plus the track. Because there is going to be, there's going to be two, there's going to be three forces on the ball. Let me draw a bigger picture. Here's my ball rolling down the track. So I have the gravitational force pulling down. I have the normal force pushing up. But there's also going to be this uh, frictional force pushing that way, and that's what's going to make the ball roll. Now, I don't want to calculate the work done by friction. Instead, I'm just going to assume this. there's three types of energy. Um, so the normal force doesn't do any work because it's perpendicular to the motion. Gravity doesn't do any work because it's part of the system. But this friction is not going to do any work because also we're going to, well, really, because it doesn't move. The displacement of this friction is zero, right? It doesn't, the, the, the contact point moves, but the, it doesn't slide. So it, it actually doesn't do zero. I don't even think I have to do this. So I'm going to have three kinds of energy. K equals one half mv squared. That's the kinetic energy of the ball because it's moving. U is mgy. This is the gravitational potential energy because I'm including the ball and the earth in the system. And then kr is one half i omega squared. This is rotational kinetic energy due to the ball spinning. Now in this case, omega is the angular velocity and I is the moment of inertia. I don't have to write it again. Moment of inertia. And so this is a property that tells you how the, uh, the mass is distributed about the axis of rotation. And if the ball is rolling like this, it's spinning about its center, then for a ball, I is 2 fifths m r squared, where r is the radius of the ball, m is the mass. Now, we actually know something else. If the ball is rolling and not slipping, then omega equals V over R. Because the motion of the center of the mass depends on how it rotates. And so this is going to be true for any rolling without slipping object. So I can write the rotational kinetic energy as one half I, which is going to be two fifths M R squared uh, times the omega squared, which is going to be V squared over R squared. Now the R squareds cancel and I get one-fifth m v squared. Okay, so let's put this together for the work energy principle. So there's no work done, so I have zero equals delta k plus delta u plus delta k r. And in my problem, I just like before, uh, I'm going to use this h2. I'm going to use this as y equals zero. And so this is point zero, this is point one, uh, and I'm going to go from zero to one. So I have, I'm just going to start from rest up here, so I have zero equals k1 minus k0 plus u1 minus u0 plus kr1 minus kr0. And that's zero, and that's zero. So I get k1 is going to be the velocity right here that is moving with v1. So it's 1 half m v1 squared. u1 is the potential right here. So that's going to be plus mg 
y1, which is h2, minus m g uh, y2, which is h1 plus h2, right? Because that's the height of the whole thing. And then I have uh, plus one half m, no, one fifth m v1 squared. That's the velocity at the end based on its rotational motion, but that's a one fifth. So these two terms I can combine together. So this is going to be equal to uh, one, this is going to be five tenths plus two tenths mv1 squared. And then right here I have mgh2 minus, there's going to be a minus mgh2. So this is just going to be uh, minus mgh1 equals zero. Uh, I can divide both sides by the mass. And I'm going to add that to the other side, combine these, I get 7 tenths v1 squared equals gh1. Now I can solve for v1. v1 is going to be the square root of 10 sevenths gh1. Okay, so now I can move on to the second part, which is projectile motion. Now, really, there's nothing that's going to change in this second solution except I'm starting with a different velocity. But I'm going to work it through the whole way anyway. Okay, so let me write this up here. Let's just say this. So this is V1. This is H2. And I want to find this distance. I'm calling it S. Uh, and for projectile motion, I'm going to say V1 equals the square root, what did I just say it was? Seven, 10 sevenths g h1. Okay, so in projectile motion, I can break this into an x and a y coordinate, a y motion, and that's my origin right there. So I can say x motion. Uh, my initial x, x1, this is the final x is x2. x1 is zero, right, it starts at x equals zero x2 equals s equals we don't know, we're trying to find that. And then since the acceleration is zero in the y direction and the x direction, there's no forces in the x direction, I can say x2 equals x1 plus v1t. So this is assuming t equals zero at that starting point. Now I don't know t, I do know v1. I can write this as x2, x1 to zero. So I get the square root of 10 sevenths, that's a whole square root, g h1 t. So I just need to find t. So let's move to the y motion, y motion, and that's going to be equal to the initial y position. y1 is going to be h2. y2, the final y, is 0. a y is going to be negative g. The acceleration in the y direction is negative g. Uh, and then v this is v1x. v1y is going to be equal to zero. If the ball is launched horizontally, then the velocity, the initial velocity in the, in the y direction is zero. So I can write y2 equals y1 plus vy1t minus one half g t squared. So I know that's zero. I know that's zero. So I get y2, I'm sorry, that's zero, that's not zero, that's h2. So I get h2 equals one half g t squared. So t squared is two h2 over g, and t is the square root of two h2 over g. Now, I can take this and put it in right there. And if I do that, I get x2 is the square root of 10 over 7 g h1 times the square root of 2 h2 over g. Since these are both in a square root, those cancel. Um, I can multiply, I can actually factor out a 2 and a 2 there and I get 2 times the square root of 5 over 7 h1, h2, and that is my s value. So just com for comparison, uh, before I had s equals 
to the square root of h1, h2. So in this case, I'm multiplying by a number less than one, so it's not gonna go as far. It's not gonna go as far because once it gets to the bottom, it's not gonna be going as fast because it has to be, the energy goes into rotation and translation, so you have to split some of the energy, you're not gonna be going as fast. But that would be the answer if you have a rolling ball. Notice that it does not depend on the radius of the ball. That cancels out. What it does depend on is the, sh the kind of ball. If it was a hollow ball, then the moment of inertia would be different. You'd get a different value. If it was a disc, you'd get a different value. If it was a hoop, you'd get a different value. Okay. So these, this factor in here uh, would change. But there you go. That's, that's how far it goes if, if it's rolling and not sliding down the ramp.